Welcome everyone. Good evening. My name is Amy Anaminyi. Um, I at work. I am a performance and business manager. I work at the chief operating office of RBS International. I am based in Jersey. Um, outside of work, I am Kenyan by heritage. Um, I am the marketing and PR officer for the, the BYP Channel Islands. And today I am your speaker and host. And of course, our uh, top topic for today will be entrepreneurship in the digital age. And what we want to really get into is examining innovative startups that have leveraged technology for growth. Um, so we'll get into that in a bit more detail, but just as a bit of introduction, um, I think it's important to recognize that in today's very fast paced world, a very, you know, McDonald's style instant culture, um, entrepreneurship is rapidly evolving. And with that, you have to kind of keep up the technology in order to be ahead of the curve. So um, a lot of this is driven by consumer behavior. And I think what a lot of successful startups have done is learn that consumer behavior in order to put the right products in front of the consumer and of course drive sales. So um, I think in terms of the rise of digital entrepreneurship, if we start there, I think that can be defined by three key pillars. So number one is defining digital entrepreneurship. And I think, to give it a definition, it's all about, you know, businesses that primary op op primarily operate online um, and they utilize technology to create market and deliver products and services. So what this means is they typically strip back a lot of the overheads of traditional businesses, such as having a physical store or employing loads of staff that have to work in the store. And rather, they might operate in a very lean fashion, such as via an Etsy shop or an eBay storefront or an Amazon storefront. And it means they can really focus that capital into finding data that supports what their consumer wants. So that's probably pillar number one, just defining what the difference is between traditional entrepreneurship and digital entrepreneurship. The second one is the market demand. And I think I touched on this slightly, but what we mean by market demand is especially for that Gen Z age bracket, our needs change like this. They change immediately. Today, we want things to be green. Tomorrow, we want them to be blue. And the market needs to adapt to that constant change of wants and needs, and they need to produce products just as fast. Of course, there might be sustainability impacts in terms of how much product to produce and keep up with the ever-changing demands. But when you look at it from a business lens, Consumers are increasingly turning to digital solutions to keep up with their ever-changing needs. So you look at things like uh, Airbnb or, or um, I, I could say uh, even Monzo, and these are very user-friendly, user-focused brands that make it all about your experience rather than what the traditional banks or the traditional um, storefronts might do. So the third thing as well that I would call a, a bit of a pillar is the global reach. And again, this goes back to why this is about startups that leverage growth. The global reach is having that idea that if I make this product today, tomorrow it can be in Kenya, tomorrow it can be in Russia, tomorrow it can be in Mexico. And it's simply by leveraging um, platforms and digital abilities that make your product be seen everywhere. Of course, this extends to things like social media as well. If you have a TikTok account and you use the right types of hashtags, the right types of um, uh, like tagging, the right types of font, the right types of, um, you know, uh, frames when you record a video, that in itself can make your content go viral and in effect also make your product go viral. So in terms of digital entrepreneurs that have done and performed well, they looked with a global scale. They weren't looking to just do well in the UK. They wanted to do well all over the world. So if we think about those key strategies for success, of course, the number one obvious one would be to embrace technology. And it sounds obvious, but not all brands or not all organizations have been really comfortable to embrace technology up until the pandemic. And when we were now forced to use Zoom, when we were forced to work from home, that's when the benefits of technology really came to light. 
Um, and of course, this did very well for, for many startups that I will be familiar to you as I name them. A key one, of course, is Zoom. Um, Zoom has been in existence for many years, but it was right when the pandemic hit that all of a sudden organizations were looking into getting corporate licenses to use the product. The same with Microsoft Teams. And when you put the world in a scenario where they have no choice but to communicate virtually or in a hybrid fashion. It's very hard to take that model and put everyone back into the office and completely abandon that previous use of technology. So uh, the pandemic will forever change and shape how we use digital technology, especially in the workplace and even sometimes just in our own personal lives as well. Um, it's very normal these days for grandparents to FaceTime their their grandchildren. And that's just a, a normal way. You know, you could have a phone call, you could write a letter, but FaceTime is just so much better because, of course, you can see those expressions. Um, another example um, is Slack. I myself or my organization don't really use this one as much, but I understand it's very much a productivity tool. And the thing that makes it so brilliant is how user focused it was. It was very personalized. It was very um, quite user friendly, quite easy to get the hang of. Um, and of course, it has quite friendly packages for organizations to buy and implement within their teams and specialize to their needs. So I think kind of the common theme here, the common thread is creating a product that mirrors the circumstances of the world, for example, the pandemic. And then the second thing is, of course, making the product especially customizable to the needs of an organization. So making sure it can have branding, making sure that you can have webinar features, making sure that you have privacy features like, you know, auto deleting messages or um, flagging if any concerning keywords are discussed between colleagues. Those kind of inbuilt features are kind of the added value that will make an organization choose you versus another. Of course, there are other things as well, like um, data-driven decision-making. And we see a lot of that in, again, going back to TikTok as an example. Um, for those who may have the app, you'll be aware of the For You page. And that is literally uh, an algorithm that learns what you like, and then it keeps putting it in front of you. And a lot of other organizations have leveraged this For You page and done it in things like clothing. Thing. They've done it in things like food. If you have the Waitrose app, if you shop in Waitrose tomorrow, just do a normal weekly shop, next week they're going to send you vouchers for the things that you bought and give you money off in order to encourage you to keep coming to Waitrose. So it's little things like these where we share our data, we share our preferences with organizations and they use that data to almost predict what we're going to want next. And oftentimes it works. Um, of course, there is, again, that argument of when we share our data with these organizations, where do we draw the line? When is it that we've shared too much data with them? But in the eyes of marketing, in the eyes of um, sales and growth, they absolutely love learning our buying habits. They love learning our likes, our dislikes, how much of each thing we buy so that they can I ideally predict and put things in front of you that therefore meet your needs. So as we sort of move into like perhaps things or particular innovations that are shaping entrepreneurship, I would say, of course, social media, media marketing is a huge one. You would, of course, heard about being an influencer. You might know an influencer. You might have watched an influencer. And this is not a career that really existed 10, 15 years ago. Of course, YouTube was there, but not many people were making a full blown full-time career out of being a YouTuber or being a TikToker. But these days, that's a genuine career. If I tell, if, if my niece came up to me and says, I want to be a TikToker when I grow up, that's a viable career if she finds the correct niche. So I think it's about, as I said, finding the right niche, finding your audience and seeing how you can really leverage them to put products in front of them that meet their needs. Um, some people that have done that, for example, is people that specialize in travel content or um, content that's about money management or content about fashion, content about relationships, you know, things that are kind of pertinent to everyday life and relate to everyone. Everyone's gonna always want to know how to make more money. Everybody's going to want to know how to make better food, like how to be a better cook. So cooking videos, 
perform brilliantly on TikTok. And it's things like that where you can take a very simple idea and you can scale it to be able to leverage that growth. So I think at this stage, if, now that we've spoken about, you know, what is digital entrepreneurship? How do people make it work? I would like to kind of touch on a few case studies. So um, I have mentioned a few keywords. I've, you've heard me talk about Zoom, Slack. Um, but another one I wanted to touch on was um, WhatsApp, which I'm sure everybody in this call knows and uses. Um, WhatsApp in 2016 had 1 billion active users. And at that time, and of course, it's still ever growing, really symbolized to the industry, to the world, that WhatsApp is here to stay. And the reason and how they did that was by having a USP, a unique selling point that no other messaging platform could quite match. And what they decided to specialize in was security. So WhatsApp is known for end-to-end -end encryption. Um, when you send a message on WhatsApp, it should be safe. There should be no way someone should be able to hack you. Um, and they do that in a variety of ways. Um, for example, of course, you have the ability when you send a picture, you can send it once and that picture cannot be screenshotted. Um, you might have seen recently, they've implemented a new feature where you cannot screenshot someone's profile photo. Again, symbol of, you know, trying to show security. Um, other things that they do is, of course, if you make calls, videos, if you buy a new phone and you want to transfer your chats, you can back them up or you can decide to wipe them completely. And it's things like that where they've chosen to drill down on one specific um, user-friendly fe user feature and become really good at it that they've been able to perform so brilliantly. And of course, um, phone providers, Apple, Android are able to trust them with um, having you know, their interface into things like WhatsApp for business or WhatsApp for companies, because they know that it's a very reliable app. And if for a single moment, they thought that WhatsApp could be easily hacked, they wouldn't you know, have WhatsApp for business. So that's one key example. Um, another one, and I wanted to touch on one that's perhaps away from the Western society. Um, for those who are familiar with M-Pesa, um, which is based and was founded in Kenya, but has expanded across East Africa, is a uh, money, money platform, if I can call it that. Um, it was founded in 2007 through a partnership with Vodafone. And at the time, over 80% of Kenya did not have a formal banking method in 2007. So when M-Pesa came along, the reason why it was so revolutionary was not just because it gave you a way to deposit and withdraw money or send money to pay bills, to buy goods. One of the reasons why it was so revolutionary is because anyone from the president to someone selling vegetables in the street would use M-Pesa. It was non-discriminatory discriminatory sorry it really was inclusive it, as long as you had a mobile phone and a form of id you could have mpesa and i think that kind of inclusive nature is really what helped mpesa take off um, and as i mentioned it started in kenya with the help of um, vodafone or airtel um, and now it's expanded to uganda to tanzania it's it's a very well known and, and still respected to this day platform for for transactions um, and of course, the way that they make their money is by issuing a small fee with each transaction. But if millions and millions of Kenyans are using this, they are, of course, making an insane amount of money. And the kind of concept of M-Pesa is very simple. But the fact that it's been able to give a new lease of life to business owners, entrepreneurs, um, you know, people who live in remote areas of Kenya, they now have a really easy way to bank it's become such a widely trusted um, you know, platform. And again, it goes back to that thing of, in order to succeed, you need to have that one thing that makes you specialize from any other um, kind of competitor in the market. So in terms of um, case studies, those are a few that came to mind. Of course, there are many more. Um, going back to the UK, the challenger banks have really set a precedent for what we know to be banking in the world today. Um, I myself bank with both traditional um, banks and also challenger banks. And I can really say the user experience is second to none when it comes to these digital um, banking platforms. You know, you're able to um, have real time transaction updates every time you spend money, it sends a notification. And that gives you a kind of mental 
it, it, it adds friction to your spending journey because every time you see a transaction, it reminds you you're actually spending a lot of money. Um, secondly, they have things like um, separate saving pots. And this can also be really helpful for where you want to put money away for something. They don't want it to accidentally get eaten by a direct debit or um, you accidentally drop below your, your current balance and the money is gone. So in terms of my money management, I've definitely seen the benefit. And then thirdly, they um, kind of disrupted the banking game by taking away fees for foreign transactions. For many of us, we do a lot of traveling, be it to see family or just to go on holiday. And um, foreign, you know, foreign fees, currency fees can be such a, a pain. So by these challenger banks coming in and saying no fees, that made the traditional banks have to sit back and think, oh, now we have to charge no fees as well, because what's our, why would people still go with us? So I definitely think that there's an element of all these um, examples of startups, be it Zoom, be it Uber, be it Airbnb, they've come in and they've disrupted a market. Um, if I could just touch on those two as well, Airbnb and Uber are special because they're what I like to call facilitator um, organizations. Airbnb doesn't necessarily own any houses itself. Uber does not necessarily own cars. I think it does now, but originally when it started, it does it did not own like cars or, or like have cars. It just owned a service where people could sign up to be a driver they come with their own car and then uber just facilitates by giving them the customers the same thing with airbnb you have the house and then they give you the contacts they give you the guests and during every transaction of course they take a fee but it just meant that they don't have to have any initial um huge amounts of stock in order for them to do well so i definitely think that there's a lot we can learn from these examples you know all these people once started with just one customer and now they're billion dollar or billion pound making um organizations but uh, at this stage i'd love to sort of open up the floor and really discuss how these examples of well performing startups well performing companies how can we perhaps think of the next thing how can we bring this to a lens of jersey for those who are based in the channel islands is there any problem? Is there any challenge that we currently face on the island that we could perhaps use a digital startup to fix? Um, it would be really interesting to know, given many of us on this call are, you know, from Africa, we have um, connections at home and we have a lot of ideas. How, how can we bring those ideas and bring them to fruition in a way that is number one sustainable, but of course something that benefits our community as well? Um, so yeah. This stage I'm going to open the floor for questions and I believe the first person I'd love to go to is our chapter lead Gamu um, and I've also seen um, a question come through in the Q&A so please do send questions in the Q&A if you don't want to come off mute but of course if you'd like to come off mute the floor is open but at this stage I will hand Gamu. Thank you Amy that was a very educational um, and it took the tone I think um, for us understanding just the background of digital, the digital aid and how much it has um, just flourished, especially in an African context. It's been really helpful in uh, advancing remittances as well for those of us that are in the diaspora sending money home. Um, I suppose my first question is, so are there any kinds of things that we can do outside of, say, maybe YouTube or some of these user apps that ask you to, you know, to give your information yeah. And maybe you get vouchers in return or something. Are there any sort of things that we can do to gain an income using, you know, utilizing these digital technologies that you mentioned? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think it's a tricky one because, like you said, a lot of these side hustles, a lot of these um, passive income, you know, opportunities usually require you to give something in return, be it your data or a small amount of investment. Um, but to answer your question, I think there could be a way that um, you could perhaps use your own knowledge or your own sort of natural talents to gain an income. For example, um, if you were perhaps very talented at cooking or very talented at styling or you had just a, you know, a skill that you were naturally good at and you wanted to spread some knowledge, you could easily, um, you know, share these on your own already pre-made social media accounts, be it Instagram, be it Facebook, be it Twitter. And if you were to gain enough momentum, 
um, you might find that um, companies want to work with you, like they want to collaborate with you. Um, and, you know, every time someone buys a, a product with your code, it could be like Amy 10. If someone buys something with my code, I then, you know, receive a cut for the, the purchase that they've made using my, my discount code. So there are simple things like that where you don't need to create a new account from scratch. Um, of course, there is kind of the, the the good old simple thing as well, where if you are based in Jersey, you'd be aware that we have local markets that happen during things like Africa Week. Um, they sell everything from Kitenge to Maasai sandals to, you know, um, Zulu beads. Like they, they sell a variety of things. And if perhaps you are able on a trip home, like if you went to, to wherever home may be and you were to buy, you know, a few things in wholesale and you brought them back to Jersey, they absolutely would, you know, sell very well because people really appreciate, you know, um, buying into that culture, buying into the beauty of the beads, the colours. So I think that the thing to remember here is to be able to have a passive income, to have a side hustle, you don't need to be this full-blown entrepreneur. I think the word entrepreneur can be scary to people sometimes, but anyone can be an entrepreneur. All these people who created Airbnb, who created Uber, like they were all a baby once. They were, they're just human beings like us. So I think it's all about just having the idea and talking to people to see how you can scale it. Definitely reach out to that community, put the idea forward and see how we can put two minds together and, and create something. Um, so yeah, that's my take on it. Um, Ope, did you have any thoughts? I just check the Q and A. Oh, sorry, I don't know if Ope you're on mute. Okay, not to worry. Well, thank you to Zakaya's point in the chat about um I'll just read it. Another yes, sorry. Oh, no, right, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, hi Amy. Um I was trying to unmute for the longest time anyway. I dropped my comments in the chat and I was saying that um when it comes to Jersey, it yeah. feels like there's a skill shortage of digital and tech skills in Jersey. And sometimes I often wonder if there could be some sort of partnership with governments to attract the skills to the island and that would then lead to an eventual integration of that skill on the island for example update the school curriculum i know in the uk they have like one nation tech visas and things like this to attract the skill and yeah. then for me the the dream jersey would be you know that little island that has a lot of tech skills and then we yeah. are we are driving like tech solutions to the world so mm -hmm. In Jersey, definitely a skill shortage. All the time, tech roles are on for months and months on field. So, yes, yes. That, yes. that's just my thoughts. On, there's definitely a lot of opportunity to attract tech to the island. Yeah, no, completely agreed. And it's a great that up because I think the staff shortage isn't just limited to tech. It's in quite a few industries that they're lacking. And I think there was a study that was done where they found that between the ages of 18 to 29, that's the biggest um, like age gap that we're, we have for skill shortage, because as you do, people go to university, they go traveling, they go to the UK, they go to other places, and then they don't come back to Jersey. So if you think about things like the skills required to, to work in tech, that kind of digital mindset, it often is in that a sort of 10 year age bracket. Um, and, and as you said, Jersey is sort of desperately um, uh, kind of lacking in that at the moment. Um, so definitely echo your thoughts in terms of there could be a point there about how can the government try to attract more talent that can perform in this space? Because I think Jersey is really a really good like testing bed for a lot of these things because we are a small island. There's a lot we can try out. And if it doesn't work, it's OK. Um, and we can just, if it does work, we can leverage it, we can grow it to the UK and, and even, you know, further abroad. So just going to note that down, but I definitely think um, talent attraction is a key point. I've just seen another chat message come through, which is a question. What tools can help with digital marketing these days? It feels like you need to be able to, you need to be available to create content, make tweets, et cetera. Is there a better, less time consuming way? That's a really great question, Athena. Thank you so much. Um, one that's been on my mind for a while as well, because I think for me as a person, I have these really creative, great ideas and, you know, I want to put them into practice and, and make my, you know, what's in here come out on paper. 
whatever. But the time is, is, is the factor here. And a lot of us are time poor. We have day jobs, we have families, we have commitments. Um, and I think, I hope this doesn't seem like a, a sort of cop out answer, but the, the answer here might be um, leveraging more of AI because I think, you know, we would have all perhaps tried chat GPT before. Um, when you first use it, it feels like the, the, the best thing since sliced bread. Like, you know, you just tell it to do something and it just brings it in 10 minutes. And it's almost like sometimes that could have taken you an hour to come up with. So of course there is the point around chat GPT and similar AI tools are not human. So they will never communicate. They will never word things how we would word them, but you could, you, in terms of inspiration, in terms of um, getting your ideas out on paper, don't be afraid to leverage AI, um, even just to be able to have a starting point and then you can work from there. Because I often find, for me, um, I, I'll have an idea, but I just never have the time or maybe the courage to just put it on paper. But um, just typing in a, a prompt or even just typing what I have so far into ChatGPT can be like a good starting point and then it gets the ball rolling. Um, if you want something that was able to sort of create a document for you, I would recommend, I believe it's called gamma.com, G-A-M-M-A.com. Um, and you can tell it to like, and let's say, I don't know, you can tell it to make you a, a wedding invite and you tell it what, what the color scheme is and this and that, and it will create uh, the, the document for you. Of course, you have to be quite descriptive to get the outcome that you want. But if you want uh, an AI tool that has a visual element, I would definitely recommend um, gamma.com. I think I've seen another thing come in. Um, I'm from London and tech is generated, oh, sorry, is integrated in everyone's lives. And I'm sure it's the same in Jersey as well. AI is a growing hot topic everywhere. How do you feel AI can be integrated in everyday life to help make life easier the way smartphones did? That's a really good question. I'm actually going to open this one to the floor. Um, of course, the team, Gamu Ope, if you have any thoughts, would you like to jump in, please? Hi. Um, there are lots of ways I feel like AI can definitely um, make life easier, so to speak. So, um, for instance, um, integrating it into our workplace, I think, is a really good place. So you have the likes of ChatGPT and others, um, even in Microsoft Office, they have capabilities for, for your writing, to improve your writing and yeah. to produce um, different types of documents, depending on your audience. And what you can also do with the AI is to train it in terms of the style you want it to write in um, as it gets to actually learn you because that's that's what AI is about. So I think there are definitely a lot of avenues in the workplace, including that's just one example. But the, in the end goal, in terms of making work more efficient, there's definitely a lot of uh, manual processes that I think can be improved through the use of AI Say, for instance, I work for a financial services regulator and they just introduced a chatbot that allows the navigation of financial crime of a financial crime handbook. And that makes it a lot easier instead of having to control, find, you know, for lay people that don't understand the law, um, it becomes really easy to ask for a simple question and you can actually ask the AI to interpret it in a way that is simple for you to understand. Mm -hmm. So it's things like that. Um, just facilitating the, just making life easier in the workplace, I think is one of the key places. Um, it yeah. would be awesome. I mean, you you do have technology such as um, the fridges, the Samsung fridges that take your data as well um, and can actually sort of, you know, plan your meals based on what's in your fridge and what you prefer, what you're in the mood for, depending on how full your fridge is. And we pray for full fridges. Um <laughs> You know, there's um, a lot of ways. I mean, and obviously, as you can see, the cooking technology, as it develops, um, they are integrating more AI systems where, you know, it's not just your basic air fryer anymore. You've got um, some chef mechanisms in which you kind of just put in the ingredients and it makes whatever it is that you, that you would like it to make. Um, I mean, you know, as soon as they have a chef and you've got your, your hoovers, I call it a hoover, that's how old school I am, but you've got the small <laughs> vacuum cleaners the round ones, the little, little robots, um, you know, that can park themselves. Those are all evidence of AI growing and making our lives easier. So I think, you know, um, they always say innovation is about laziness. So 
<laughs> because you tried to figure out how to make things more efficient. Those are my yeah. concerns, yeah. No, completely agreed. I think you've encapsulated it really well there in terms of it's about that user experience. Like, you know, you can now have um, kettles that boil when you walk through the door or lights that turn off without you having to like get out of bed. And it's just little things like that. You know, as human beings, we love convenience. We love ease. We love things to just be get done without, you know, a lot of stress and, and pressure. So I definitely think that AI has a part to play there and, and will continue to play a part as life goes on. Um, so yeah, definitely thank you for that that take, Gamal. And um, just to go back to um, Zakayo's point at the start around um, another key feature that contributed to Empress's success is its ability to operate without internet access. And that is a key point. Thank you for raising that. In terms of this made Empress widely available to people in areas with limited or no internet connectivity um, and enabling them to use the service. And I can testify to that. My grandma um, does not have regular um, internet access. She doesn't she even wants it really or electricity, um, but she still uses Empesa. She's still able to, you know, receive um, the, the gifts that we give her or anything that she needs to go about her day. She's able to pay her bills. And I think that kind of unique aspect is goes back to that kind of convenience point. Um, if you make a service that relies on internet, that relies on people to live in the city, it's not going to grow, especially in, in an environment where um, there's a lot of people in, in rural areas. So I definitely think assessing your market, assessing your environment and seeing what can scale no matter where you are or, or what your situation is, is definitely a key point and is one of the reasons that M-Pesa did so well and continues to do so well. So thank you for that point, Zakayo. Um, did anyone have any other thoughts? Feel free to come off mute or to add a message in the chat. But yes. again, oh yes, yes please. please. Yes, yeah. yeah, so um, when you talked about the how we can use AI in everyday life, I think the first picture that came to mind was um, at the moment, how we use it in my household. Because if I do ask my son, what's the time? They don't even check the watch or anything to just go, Alexa, what's the time? So, <laughs> so I think I find Alexa very useful um, in terms of my everyday life. Sometimes it's about, you know, the doorbell is ringing and I can see the picture of who is at the door without any stress or any complex technology. I can say, oh, Alexa, what's the weather going to be like? And they help, that helps me to get dressed for the day. <laughs> and that's Alexa going off. <laughs> listening. <laughs> Sorry. Alexa was listening to my conversation. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so there are several ways. And another tool, you know, when you mentioned that we could use um, Gamma. I also talked about Canva. I use mm. Canva for a lot of things. So Canva is also a good tool. I can use Canva to give me thoughts, to design things, things you would naturally have paid for two, five years, three, five, four, five years ago. And, and you can just create yourself. I also find Copilot a very useful one in everyday work, as an everyday work tool. Oh, well, so uh, Copilot works well. So I just thought I might just share the names of this um, useful everyday life software. So Alexa is one, Copilot is one, Canva is one, and I'm sure there are many more, lots, lots and lots of them. If you go into the world of data, you have Atrix, you have um, Power BI and things you could ordinarily have to outsource in the past that you can now do easily for yourself. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And you actually made me smile when you mentioned um, Alexa, because I'm the same with um, my Google. So I'll be like, hey, Google, what's the weather like today? And that literally just determines what I wear. I don't have to open the window. I don't have to go outside. Um, and it's those kind of convenience things that I almost forgot what life was like before then. Um, so definitely, like, I can attest to the similar thing in my house. I really do sort of use Alexa as part of my day. She said, um, oh, sorry, Google sets my alarms. It sets timers. It tells me the weather. It, you know, it, it really is part of, like, how I keep my life on track. So yeah, definitely agreed there. I did see um, a question in the chat around, what advice do you have to use AI in an online directory? Okay, I just wanna make sure I understand the question correctly, but do you mean in creating an online directory or like one that's already in existence? Sorry, Batuli, I don't know if I need to make you come off mute there. Or, oh, in an existing one. Um, 
That's a good question. For some of these, I have to uh, admit, I'm not a, a tech expert, but if I don't know the answer, I will research it and come back to you. But what's coming to my mind at the moment is like being specific. I think wh wh how I find to make the most of AI, be it Copilot, be it ChatGPT, you need to be specific. Like those keywords need to be so to the point and if and if it doesn't give you the exact thing you want go back again and explain you know what it is you're saying so that it can give you the answers you need um don't be afraid to be quite direct with with chat gpt like it's not a person so you can be not rude but you can say like give me this or no i would like this um and, and as gamu said train them like train the the ai to know what you need to understand the way you like to speak the way you want to communicate the email the message the the the, the business you're looking for or whatever you're looking for in the directory um and over time it will begin to like it has ai memories or begin to remember your needs um so yeah i'm not fully sure on how to answer that question but i would say for now be specific um i could probably do some research on that question and come back to you I will just open the floor to Gamu and Ope to make sure they don't have any takes on that. Um, no? From my end, no take on that at all. I think it's just one that would be interesting to research, really, but I really don't know much. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to research, no problem. But thank you for the question. Um, another one has come in and it says, AI will soon start to take over mundane and repetitive tasks, which mean which means some jobs will soon die out. How do you feel people can start to prepare for AI so it can work with us and not against us? Thank you for bringing this up, Abdul, because it's a very pertinent question. It's one that probably sits in a lot of our minds. Um, and I would say from my perspective, you, I don't know if you've heard that um, saying, this sounds so bad, but they're saying this like, if you can't beat them, join them. But not that we should like try and beat AI. But what I mean to say is rather than pretending that AI will go away or rather than um, trying to ignore it or, or think that, you, you know, you can get on without it, instead embrace AI, like really go all in, really take time to read up on it, watch videos, learn how to use it, become the master of AI so that it's not the other way around, if that makes sense. Um, I think it, it can be very easy to sort of bury our heads in the sand and make it seem like, oh, if I just don't think about it, like it will go away. But the reality is the way the workforce is going, the way society is going, AI is being weaved into every facet of, of, of our lives. So um, it is important to really kind of face it head on and see how you can get upskilled in it so that you're not kind of... Um, falling behind the curve when it comes to things like you said, jobs. It could be easy things like admin jobs, writing emails, taking minutes, um, you know, doing filing, things that, as you say, can one day e easily just be done at a touch of a button. Rather than trying to um, shy away from it, almost think to yourself, what other digital skills can I, I pick up that will be more useful or like irreplaceable by AI because AI can't do everything at this stage the AI is still very much a learning model so I would say if possible carve out time to really um upskill yourself in the digital space just become more digital digitally literate um be it taking time to upskill on Canva like Ope said or taking time to understand how you can leverage um Microsoft Teams to really increase productivity in your in your the, the team that you manage or the team that you work in um think maybe think think of things that you can do to just make you almost have a new edge a new kind of um flair on your cv or on your skill set and not perhaps just relying on the things that you did 10 years ago or 15 years ago um i hope that kind of that answers your question in a way like number one learning to embrace it and number two taking that time to really digitally upskill so that um, even when AI does come and replace some jobs, that's okay because you're doing something else now. And it's something that AI at that time cannot do. Just seen another message come in. Um, thank you, Chi Chi. When you talked about Jersey being a small place and when the ages 19 to 29 graduate, they kind of don't want to come back to the island. My question is, how will the elderly people embrace the new digital entrepreneur scheme? I work in a hotel setup and the type of clientele I deal with do not embrace the new tech. Like even convincing them 
to use the Google map to find their way to and from the hotel is such a big challenge, or even telling them to check on Google places to visit. How do I go about this? That is a very good question, Chi Chi. And again, I can see how this is so relevant to living in Jersey because of course we have a lot of um, visitors to the island every year. And a lot of them can be people who are let's say retired um, and then just not keen on technology. Um, I'll give my take, but I'll also um, prompt Ope and Gamu if they want to come in afterwards. But my take on this, and I think of my grandmother when you when you said this, because my, my grandma has a, a complete aversion to technology. Like we've asked her if she wants a touchscreen phone. She doesn't want it. We've asked her if she wants to use WhatsApp so we can be like video calling. Doesn't want like not interested at all. And I think the, the key thing here to remember is these are people who've come from a time where like like my grandma was using like typewriters she was like sending letters and that was her normal way of communicating you know they come from a completely different society and for us to just expect them to just get with the times and almost be quite impatient with it is is, is, is almost unfair on them because they they've lived through so much digital change and so quickly like to think in the early 2000s the internet was not even like a something everybody or each household had. Whereas now we carry the internet in our phones, in our iPads, in our laptops, in, you know, so many ways. So I think the first thing, and it sounds obvious, but the first thing is patience. Be patient with these people because they've lived through, you know, so many eras that sometimes I think they might have just fatigue at the thought of having to learn something new. Um, I think the second thing is, almost us trying to adapt the technology to work for them. So one key thing I found, and this is even with my parents, um, the size of the text on the screen can sometimes be too small. And it just means that they're like holding their phone like this and they can't really see, and it just puts them off from wanting to use it. And these are really easy accessibility features that you can just tweak in the settings. You can literally just enlarge the text or you can um, play with the brightness so that it's not so like shouty. You can um, do certain things with a lot of these apps and technologies, even Google Maps, to make it slightly more user friendly. I know it won't be perfect, but it can just make it slightly more um, bearable for them. But yeah, those are kind of my two takes. Number one, patience. And number two, make use of the accessibility. Even if it's like they have impaired hearing, you can do things on the iPhone or the, the smartphone to make sure that they can listen to the instructions. But um, yeah, Gamu and Ope, any thoughts? Because that is an interesting and a really good question. It is. Um, I have some thoughts on the previous one, um, but I think this one is is a good question to deal with because I, my 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 perspective is that it will never. It works well with the question that was previously asked about um, what will happen. AI is going to take the boring, mundane jobs, and I yeah. think this speaks to just like the need. Um, we still want that human experience. And I think that's what's going to keep um, a lot of jobs that we think are mundane alive because what, it makes such a difference to have a tour guide. Yeah. But also the, the negative, as we were talking about, the more convenient that AI is and it can do certain things for us is the fear of the re of our reduced intelligence because we are relying on artificial intelligence. So I think what it also points to is that we need to still maintain our knowledge and still maintain relevance because we are the ones that feed into the AI. Mm -hmm. I mean, this might be a tall ask, but I can imagine trying to ask people to even read a map now for our generation is actually quite a cumbersome task. Yeah. But those are some of the things that I think we just need to stay cognizant of what it is that we enjoy about the human experience in everything that we do. And those jobs are likely to um lost um so yeah. tour guides um and the emphasis of when people come to jersey and they want to also experience the people and yeah. they also want to be told about different areas it makes such a difference to have a real person doing that and the real person can also learn more facts from the ai if they like so that they can give these tour guides and share that information for those that are not on the island as well so it works both ways um I also wanted to share the some courses that people can do as well if you want to get more knowledgeable. There's quite a few free courses on Google mm -hmm. that are offered if you want to learn more about ma from machine learning to um, basic um, AI, what it is, 
and there's a few other di Google digital skills certificates that are available. And they have different scholarships that they offer from time to time if you want to maximize your skills in the in, in terms of the digital of your, your digital skills as well, from digital marketing um, and a few others. I can't think off the top of my head right now. Mm -hmm. And Coursera is another one that has a lot of um, free AI courses. MIT also has a lot of courses available. Harvard um, has a few free courses also available for those that are interested um, in developing their skills in data analytics and things like that. So the world is your oyster. And I think we shouldn't fear AI as this kind of unknown thing, because I think at the end of the day, our, you know, if you don't evolve, you will become obsolete, whether yeah. it's AI or just somebody younger and more knowledgeable being able to do the work better than you. So we have to, I like what you said, keep your skills relevant, keep going, keep getting educated and don't get tired of that. Yeah, completely agreed. And I'm really glad you also brought up the fact that a lot of these upskilling opportunities are free. Um, and like you said, LinkedIn Learning, um, Google courses, universities are offering free courses. And there are things that you can do like on your spare time, in the week, on the weekend, like if you have an hour here and there, um, and the, the wonders they can do for your sort of um, employability are, are big. So definitely thank you for, for raising that. And I'm sure I'm happy that we can do some research and share some links after this call as well. Um, I've got another comment. I feel like social media has ruined the willingness to go out and learn. How do you ignite uh, and spark an interest of the younger generation in Jersey and elsewhere to want to learn about AI and how to use computers? It's a great question. Ope, I don't know if you're on the line. The only reason I want to... Uh, get your thoughts on this is because you mentioned about that skill shortage and maybe how we can like team up with schools and stuff don't know if you have any thoughts i again <laughs> i do have uh, some thoughts but just to lean back on your previous question on the limitations that we see and your answer on we have to be patient with the generation that is not keeping up is also i have personally experienced that religion also has a place in the adoption of ai I find like some extremists would not use AI for anything. I've, I've even had people say that's 666 and, you know, comments like that. So we're not all keeping up with the pace at which technology is advancing, but that's very normal. I just feel that at some point you will have to. So the same way that at some point everyone had to get like touchscreen phones because you just can't buy a phone in a market that has buttons anymore like you used to. So I think it will force itself into our system. But what we need to do is we need to be ready, like this generation, whoever is on the score, Jersey as a nation, needs to be in advance. We need to be ready because whether we like it or not, it will come. Mm. And at some point, people will just have to adapt to it. But on, on the willingness of people to learn AI, um, I think that, you know, when Gamma was speaking, I also thought that, some generation, if you look at it, would prefer a tour guide. But actually, this present generation do not want a tour guide. They are already used to post-COVID. Everything is online. They'd rather have their headphones on their hair and have mm -hmm. people, a machine, talk to them about it. So yeah. there's that balance of people not act. I fear that people would not want the human experience, which is what we are losing. So sometimes even at work, I think that we over automate things. We are, we are replacing humans with these. And all of that has to do with social media, the fast, um, fast, what's it called now? Fast gratification, that instance yeah. and all of that. So I think it's a problem in itself. But I, what I personally see is an opportunity for people to see how we can face these challenges. For me, I think that's another field that is opening up itself yeah. so people need to key into that and begin to see how do we get ahead of ai how do we manage a generation that does not want e-man how do we have that e-man ai integration so these are new things that are coming up but personally i am thinking oh this is an opportunity for me to learn and see advance and see what are the possible solutions to those problems so i see them as problems but i think that the biggest opportunity is we are thinking about it and um, we can come up with solutions to tackle these problems if you get what i mean um, and yeah. that's my take yeah. Um, sorry, just to add on another course that's available and they take people in cohorts and this course is really valuable because then they take you on a fellowship afterwards and you gain a community and they actually um 
look for jobs that are possible for you to apply. And that's the mm -hmm. ALX. Um, yeah. ALX. So if I, I think we should probably do um, some kind of a, a share after this of different resources. But yeah. what you do is you, you can apply... Um, they do a full scale test and they just test your your your, your capabilities and you undergo like um so I think it's a twelve week course and they've got different types of digital analytics as well as not your basic coding but deeper um coding learning as well mm -hmm. and for those that want to do financial modeling those are all available and what ALX does it facilitates your training through a professional institution that is right. um recognized. And you get the certificate to go with. And yeah, the knowledge that you gain from there is endless. And to this day, I still attend the talks. So mm -hmm. that's also a valuable source. Thank you, Gamu. I've made note of that. And um, as you said, we'll definitely make a point of sharing post-call some of these resources so you can, you know, go ahead, read into them and, and perhaps sign up as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for those questions. Did anyone have any more in our final 10 minutes? Again, feel free to come off mute or the chat box is all yours for any questions. Uh, oh, someone has said, yeah, put some of those apps in the chat, please. I believe she did say ALX, but what I'll do is make sure to write like a follow-up email or I can even um, do a LinkedIn post um, and make sure that that's all accessible for you guys. Um, but just to check, Gamma, it was ALX, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What uh, maybe we can do is if everybody can share their email addresses, mm -hmm. um, chat. Um, I, I know there was an issue with the registration line for those that wouldn't have been able to to send them to us. If you could, um, please just send us your email addresses and then we can share those with you. Really? I think Blessing has put something there so people can share their contacts um but yes any other questions and again thank you for the um questions the thoughts I have to really admit like I didn't want to be talking at you guys for an hour so I'm grateful that you've given me your thoughts your concerns your dreams your hopes like in terms of what the future might look like um and I think it, for me at least I can say it's been a really interesting discussion um both hearing with a jersey lens and also further afield how the future might look like and how we can make sure that we're prepared for it um, so, yeah, thank you for your thoughts. And please let me know if you have any final ones. Opportunity for any questions, any thoughts. And thank you, Gamu. She's just added the ALX link if you guys would like to take note of that. Lovely. Okay. For me and the team, we just want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a really, really impactful session. I've taken a lot from hearing your thoughts, as I said, um, and even ideas on how we can be um, prepared for the digital future. And of course, um, make sure that we scale and grow with it. So thank you so much for that. Um, and as always, the BYP Channel Islands team will be coming out with more events um, in 2025. So please do keep posted on our social media. Um, we'll be sure to sh share those links in the email. Um, and yeah, as for the rest of this evening, we wish you a lovely rest of the evening, a lovely rest of the week, um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. So thank you so much.